So today we're back on podcast. It's been two weeks. Back on podcast. Are we doing the same thing? Is this a continuation? This is a continuation of the beginning. So the beginning. <laughs> in the beginning was the first week. Um, well, in the beginning was the principle and foundation. That's true. Father. We've already kind of covered the beginning, <laughs> and now we're in the beginning of the, the beginning. The, the begin- second part of the beginning. The second part of the beginning. Part two of part one. Right. <laughs> it's like St. Thomas Aquinas <laughs> in the Summa. <clears throat> second question. Part one. Part two. Part one. Yes. Two. Against the... <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah. How are, how are things? Oh, so home. good. You know what? We've had students... Yeah. We've had students on campus. I had, now this was apparently a small class compared to yours, but I had like 13 kids, 13, 14. Yeah. Which, I mean, my normal class is about 21, which means I had, I mean, yeah, I still had five or six uh, in Zoom land, as I've been calling it. Um, Magical place. Magical place. Unicorns. Well, I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't go that far. So I still had a lot on Zoom, but there were a lot in, in person, and it was cool. Yeah. And it was cool. It's almost like real life. <laughs> almost. It's almost IRL. It's true. Yeah, I had 21 in my classroom, mm. and uh, it was the <laughs> best class I've had. I mean, really, it's probably like the best day of teaching I can remember. Yeah. Because I feel like I often forget the good days, and I just remember the bad ones. And this was a moment for me to be like, hey, this is, yeah. this is like what it could be. Yeah. Uh, and what it maybe should be. Yeah. Well, that's a th- I mean, did I ever tell you that story about how how I relate to homilies to preaching? No, I don't think so. <laughs> this is slightly off topic, but kind of funny. So, you know how. Uh, and this is before I became a priest, before I started preaching before. Today's my anniversary of a uh, diaconate ordination. Happy anniversary. Uh, by the way, uh, you're always a deacon. Always you're a deacon. still a deacon. That's right. Uh, in the line of Phoebe. <laughs> uh, so, you know how people will say, oh, how is the homily? You know, how's the preaching? After you've, you know, when you come home, your friends are like, hey, what's going on? Blah, blah, blah. How's the preaching? And honestly, I can never remember. Yeah. However, there's an exception to that. I can always remember when the homily was bad. Yeah. I can always remember a bad homily. Right. The good, so I take that kind of as a sign. Was it good or not? Well, I can't remember, so it probably was probably good. Was good. Yeah, <laughs> because which it ma- means that you're not focusing on the homilies. Exactly. Or the, the quality exactly. Of the homily. It's you're there about like prayer. Move to prayer. Yeah, and that's a sign like the it. ones that I remember. I would just, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've had this experience as well, where it's like, it's either about the priest himself or about you know whatever his pet, um, pet project or hobby or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like it totally brought me out of that sacred space into uh, your space, right? Uh, so, so, I mean, similar to what you were saying, I think there's a natural tendency that we've got to forget the good and only focus in on the bad. Right. I mean, it's like when we get our, our, uh, class reviews or what do they call them? The teacher, teacher, feedback yeah. surveys. it's like you get, you know, 99 good ones, but that one bad one is literally the only one that you read. Right. And the one that you freak out about. Right. I freak out about. Right. Yeah. I think when you, when you're talking about the homilies, there's a quality of like self forgetfulness mm-hmm. that I forget myself. Uh, and so I forget kind of like uh, maybe, yeah, the particulars of where I am or who is preaching, and I'm drawn up into kind of contemplation. Yeah. And contemplation, I think, by its nature is a, is a kind of self-forgetfulness, um, uh, that I'm drawn into union with God, and so I kind of forget myself to some extent. Uh, I still <laughs> remain myself, but yeah. but I'm, I'm drawn up yeah. into union with another, and so there's like a quality of forgetfulness that's, that's tied up in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but we're drawn back down by the weight of sin. Sin. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's legitimately why we begin the exercises that way, right? This whole first week is a meditation on sin. Right. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Uh, before we do that, can we pray? Yeah, let's pray. Okay. Can I pray? You can pray. Okay. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good and loving God. You are the source, the creator of all that is good, of all that is. We ask your blessing to come down upon us this day, this week, as we continue to, to search, to seek uh, you in our lives, in the mundane, in the ordinary, but also in the extraordinary. When wonderful things happen, we trust, uh, we know that you are there, and we trust that we will have, we will have the faith and the wisdom to see you in all that we do. 
be with us and bless us. Help us to know our faults so that we may continue to work towards your greater glory. And we ask all of this through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so like I said, I think that really is one of the uh, the beautiful things about the spiritual exercises. You know, it, it often, when you, okay, slow down, back up. <laughs> uh, start. Yeah, I get excited when I talk no, about this. So I know, I know. Can I get, it's uh, a big deal. <laughs> I think one of the things, you know, when people are just starting to learn about the spiritual exercises, or even people that, you know, are somewhat familiar with like the lingo, but they've never like done it or spent any amount of time actually praying, not even, mm, do I want to say that? Not so much not praying about it, but not praying with someone else. Like St. Ignatius never intended these to be just, you, you do this on your own. Here's your guide. This is a guide for the director. Right. And so I think that that's a really crucial dynamic that sometimes we forget about because when it's just me, right, and I'm reading this book, it's like, okay, well, cool. This is hard, so I'm going to, like, take it easy, right? I want to I wanna go a little bit easier. Or I go the opposite direction and just go to the extreme. Like, this is talking about sin, so I'm going to go to the very extreme of my own personal sin. I think there is a quality of, of sin that it um, we don't have we don't often have a like an accurate s- uh, sense of the scope of the sin of um, I think it's very difficult for us to judge um, well first of all just to know our sins I think there's a challenge on that level um, and also to know the the extent to which we're we're bound by them or the extent to which they kind of obscure our vision or muddle our way of thinking or um, cause us to be ignorant uh, I mean I think that you know uh, the effects of the of the fall in the garden are ignorance um, and death, um, and uh, and so we experience that. I think even as we're trying to know our own sins, is mm-hmm. that we're often ignorant of them, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and we resent them. We know that this isn't a part of us authentically, um, and yet we struggle to see it clearly. And I think that's one of the one of the fruits of the the first week that we hope for is uh, a sense of of the gravity of sin. Uh, but also a sense that it's not the end, that it's not ultimately um, what defines us, that there's something that comes before uh, our sin that um, is who we are, um, and that the sin is kind of a, a corruption of that. So, yeah, I, I think, yeah, what is, how do we come to see our sin accurately, as maybe as God does, or hmm. f- as, it, as it truly is, mm-hmm. and not um, either as too little, as my sins aren't really that great, or I haven't really offended God very much in my life. Um, I'm not like one of those big sinners, those yeah. bad sinners. Uh, but also not to say that... Uh, Hello, Pharisee and tax collector. Right. But <laughs> also that, you know, my sin is not uh, so great that it can never be forgiven. Or, um, again, I think there's a, a danger of kind of presumption. I'm not mm-hmm. really a big sinner or despair of I can't possibly be yeah. a friend of God. Yeah, you know, and it's it's funny. I've been thinking a lot about this recently, actually. We had our conversation last night um, about some pretty difficult topics. And one of our uh, one of our brothers mentioned the fact that, so going back to preaching for just a, a quick sec, uh, a lot of our preaching has kind of lost its its edge, lost its bite, that you know, we're so we're so happy to actually have people in the pews that we don't want to like offend them or challenge them. And so we'll say things, and I've done this myself, we'll say things like, okay, like, oh, I know I'm preaching to the choir, like you're here and they're out there. And so th- I think that Im- maybe subconsciously or kind of gives an implicit presumption that, well, you're not sinning. Because so you're in church. Because you're in church, you're not sinning. And I think that's doing a lot of damage. Yeah. Like, again, subconsciously, like, we're not actively trying to tell people that there's no sin in the world. Yeah. But we're trying to qualify it in such a way that we start to think, oh, yeah, no, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well. You know, we're, we're out there calling out, you know, we've, we can go out there and preach till we're blue in the face about politics and uh, hatred and blah, blah, blah. But if we're not, like, but if people aren't going to confession... <laughs> right. Like if there's uh, if there's a sense that well, the peop- your flock, they've if they've got the sense that they are not in need of God's mercy, there's a problem there. Yeah, and that needs attention more than, I dare say, 
could be a bit of controversy, uh, I dare say that that's more important than preaching about politics and, and things that are happening, you know, headlines, uh, right. newsworthy yeah, events. events. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to make it very... Yeah, Is that bad? Should I not say that? No, I think there's something there. I think that we do often uh, struggle to... Um, I mean, there's a tension here, right? That uh, the the priest in his office as a, as a preacher, um, as a pastor, uh, is constantly trying to reach out to those kind of those mm-hmm. street, those sheep that have gone astray. Um, and we can be so concerned about the number of sheep in front of us, right? The number of uh, that, that tally on YouTube of how many yeah. people are watching my live stream. Yeah. You know, like that's... Uh, there's kind of a perverse preoccupation, I think, at times with with numbers. Um, but there's also just an authentic desire that uh, the whole world be saved, that my congregation be sure. the entire population of my of the geographic area of my parish, right? That, that's, that's something that a pastor should really strive for. Is mm-hmm. like, if there's someone in my parish, geographic parish, they should be coming to Mass every Sunday. Yeah. Uh, and where our work isn't done, it's not even done even if that's true, but it's <laughs> especially not done if uh, there are people who haven't uh, heard the invitation to come to this parish yeah. and to come, to, yeah. come to receive the sacraments. So there's that. There's also the sense of, well, the people in the parish, uh, in order for this to be meaningful, in order for this to actually change the world, in order for other people to be drawn into it, this parish has to be uh, purified. It has to be holy. Mm-hmm. It has to be made up of authentic Christians who are transformed by the message that they receive. And, uh, and so we have, to, we have to preach the hard, the hard truth and the hard gospel to the people who are coming, but we don't want them to become like the people who aren't there, the lost sheep, you know? So yeah. there's, a, there's a tension there, and um, I suppose it's a matter of prudence, but it, it's well, also... Maybe you do you do a little bit of both. You do the encouragement all the time, but then you also do the the kind of the chastisement or the correction at times as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny though. Like th- in again, like this is the beautiful thing about the spiritual exercise, and I'm jumping the gun um, considerably. Like that's the whole reason why there are two sets of discernment of the spirits in the exercises: one for the first week, one for those that are just coming to know the spiritual life, so the people on the outside. Right. And then we've got a whole other list. For the second week, for those already who have already made that decision, made that election, right. who are there in church, right? Uh, and so, like, yeah, do we? Are we trying? To, I I wonder if we're trying to boil everything down to so simple and bite-sized, uh, soundbite quality uh, stuff that we're kind of losing that that nuance. That you know, this this is a different message, in a sense. Yes. I mean, it's the same. There is one message, one gospel, but like there are four evangelists for written gospels. Like we've got to tailor this to fit your particular needs, and there's not just one catch-all. Right. I mean, um, you can think of it as someone who's recovering from an illness, right? That, that when they first recover from the illness, they might have a very particular and restricted diet. That they can only yeah. I don't know what, what you give someone who has a, like a stomach illness, like <laughs> only milk or never milk. I don't know what like milk? what's good, like only like spinach. <laughs> I don't know what you give someone you who jumps straight to milk, huh? Well, that's like it's like ch- children are good with milk. I don't know. Maybe if you're recovering from illness, milk is good for you. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, maybe yeah. like maybe it's vegetables mm. alone, mm-hmm. um, greens, and not a lot of. I don't know what. What do you give someone who's? Do you do you have any better ideas of what you? Give I mean, someone? I would have said like broth. You know, okay, clear broth. liquids. Got it. Yeah. Clear, oh yeah, the clear liquids and bread. Now you're making fun of me. Uh, the, no, no. Uh, you're no, fine. You're no. fine. So yeah, but anyways, you give broth. Or bread, I guess white white diet, right? Don't sure, you, like cauliflower I mean, and bread, maybe that, that's a white. Okay. Oh yeah, no, I've heard that. I've heard that. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. give the uh, like anything that's has no color, mm-hmm. no acidity to it, something that's easy on the digestion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's only after someone is well for a, for a considerable amount of time that then they can move on to yeah. you know spicy food or other things that are like harder on digestion. Mm-hmm. I think maybe the, the same is true of of our soul when we're uh, when we're first entering in when we're in the uh, first week. There's a certain diet. Uh, mm. The first, the the uh, rules for discernment for the first week, yeah, that are kind of like the basics that are easy to digest, uh, pretty clear cut, right? Avoid mortal sin. That's, <laughs> I mean, it seemed like yeah. okay, yeah, like that's that's clear enough actually. Uh, but then later on, the movements of the second week, yeah, um, kind of bring more nuance and more accurately reflect, I think, the uh, the experience of someone who's moving beyond uh, just avoiding mortal sins to now. Uh, kind of struggling to to know the will of God and to uh, root out even mm-hmm. even venial sins, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's an exercise regime. Yes, like exactly. we're we're, we're spiritual developing, yes. yeah, developing our spirit to be able to take more and more, and to be able to not even. So again, I think that's one of the misconceptions is that we we want to be able to say that okay, I'm doing the work, I'm doing these exercises, I'm getting stronger, 
so that I can like bear more <laughs> when the goal of these is to, it, well, it is true to bear more, but it's to bear more of that, of God's love <laughs> to be able to open up my heart. Right. So that I can, I can receive that love rather than what comes more naturally, which is to build that wall, to say no, um, to shut myself off. Uh, yeah. Interesting. What were you, what was your experience? So we're a little bit, Oh, excuse me. We're a little bit um, removed from this, what, 10, 11 years, 12 years, 13, 13 years? years? Yeah, <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, yeah, we made the retreat. I made the retreat in the fall of 2008. Yeah. And you were in four? 2005. Five. So it's been a while. 15 years, yeah. Whew, lordy. Um, time flies. What are your recollections of praying over sin, that first week experience? To be honest, I mean, I think, um, and this, I think it's a reflection of just dif- different personalities of what the struggles of the first week are. Um, I think I spent several days uh, meditating on, um, like, Lord, you've probed me and you know, you know me, um, Psalm 139, and uh, different kind of more the, the love side of the first week. Um, that that was the hard thing for me to to accept, I think, that uh, I, would, I had been kind of a, or I am a, a pretty scrupulous person, and um, and that's not exactly the same as being mindful of one's sins and having a sense mm-hmm. of the scope of the sins, right? There is a there is a sort of um, lack in scrupulosity, but I had been, um, I was young, uh, inexperienced, uh, scrupulous, and so the struggle for me in the first week was, uh, like, am I, am I worthy of God's love? Can mm-hmm. God really love me? Yeah. Um, am I good enough uh, to make this retreat? Uh, is this is it like the evil spirit was working in all sorts of ways to kind of persuade me that I wasn't ready to make the retreat and doing lots of other things in that way, uh, just because of where I was coming from. So I think the the struggle. Uh, I think there are others um, probably who have much more like vivid um, uh, like remorse for like. Uh, particularly sinful periods in their life, and I, I mean, I had I had that in some to some extent, but uh, for me, the struggle was uh, just to to accept love, um, and that uh, my sin primarily has been a rejection of, of mm-hmm. love and friendship. I think over the years, um, and uh, and so that was kind of the yeah the point of, of struggle. I, I would say ultimately it was I, I think we did like eight days, uh, or maybe not eight, maybe six days of first week stuff. Yeah, I was just trying to remember that because th- they're not all. I mean, we talk about the weeks, but they're not like calendar not seven, seven day days. Periods, right. um, and I can't remember if this was one of the longer ones or the shorter ones. The third week is short for sure. Right. I anyway. want to say this was like six to eight days. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, which sounds, I, I suppose, that sounds like a long time, but uh, to really do all the meditations mm-hmm. and to uh, just begin the retreat and get into the routine of, of daily yeah. prayer, or praying four or five times a day. Well, and that's part um, of it as well. Like you, there's a there's this program that you've got to kind of establish and get familiar with. And so I think, yeah, that's part of the reason why it is a, a bit more programmed, and perhaps even a bit longer than right. than some of the other weeks. It's because you're you're getting into mm-hmm. the exercises mm-hmm. as as like and a, it's hard. As a like routine. this is something that we don't want to do. Uh, I remember being exhausted, yeah. um, especially when I began. But even I think af- after a while, I kind of got into the routine and the and the. And you know, having five hours of prayer a day, and exercise, and meals, and going on walks, and you kind of get into a routine. And uh, the struggle is that there's in really tremendous interior work going on that the Lord is really like doing tremendous work mm-hmm. um, interiorly, but physically, um, it's kind of set, and the kind of the the routine of my day was pretty well set, and so I was able to rely on that. But I think the the process of kind of putting that in place that those that first week, yeah, um, was kind of exhausting. Uh, and it sounds crazy to think that you're sitting in a comfy armchair uh, for five <laughs> hours a day, and you're like, "Oh, I'm, I'm wiped," you know? It's like, wow, how is this possible? But it's true. I mean, yeah. um, I think that sort of attentiveness, you know, I think especially of my uh, my experience of doing spiritual direction in a women's prison in California, mm-hmm. um, and it was only an hour that I was with uh, each of these women, uh, but to listen that intensely to someone's experience and like the the pain and the and the struggle, but also the hope and um, you know, trying to think of just the right scripture passage to, to use in response uh, to, or to give them to pray with or, or whatever else. It was exhausting. And I would walk yeah. out of that, that women's prison, not having done a whole lot that day apart from that one conversation, mm-hmm. absolutely exhausted. 
Um, and I think something true is I think something similar is, is true of the uh, the first week and of the of the whole exercise is that yeah that we don't maybe imagine that this is work that this is difficulty um, and it should be I mean in some sense it's God's work and so it's not a matter of me you know gritting my my teeth and clenching my fists and and getting through it um, that's not at all at at all but but there is a level of cooperation and a level of attentiveness I think mm-hmm. that. It can be kind of physically taxing. Yeah, um, and I definitely experienced that. Yeah, I mean, I did uh, the same experience out at the out at the, the women's prison, uh, and I totally agree. And I think there's a similar thing that's happening right now with uh, returning to 100 percent student students on campus. Like, yes, I don't know how what your experience was, uh, but like yesterday was exhausting. Right. In a different way, you know, like. The, that first Zoom class was also exhausting. Like, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to do this? Yeah. And, now, and it's like, okay, well, I got kind of, fami- I exercised enough and I got a mm-hmm. little bit more familiar. And now we've, we're kind of transitioning away from that. And it's like, oh my gosh, oh, it's so much, it's so, like, I have to go and talk to each of these kids individu- <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> individually. It's like, oh my God, right. how do I do this? Right. Um, I, I but think that's, that's but that's part of it, yeah. Yeah, I think that transition is difficult because, uh, at least for me, I'm very attentive to the people around me, which is, mm-hmm. can be a gift. It can be a great priestly gift to be attentive to um, the people in front of you and, and kind of uh, intuiting what they're what they're feeling or thinking um, or you know, kind of how to how to help them. Um, but it can also mean that I'm constantly like looking to other people and looking at trying to, and like mm-hmm. putting my heart out um, and um, kind of trying to trying to be attentive to every single person in the room. Yeah. And that can be exhausting when they themselves are in, in this kind of like tumultuous phase. Yeah. Um, so if people are kind of generally going pretty consistent and steady and nothing's really changing all that much, right? Um, being emotionally invested in 21 people is not actually that mm-hmm. difficult to do, mm-hmm. right? But if everyone is possibly in a different place and everyone's experiencing like a diff- different level of anxiety or difficulty or struggle uh, and that they're experienced because they're younger than me and in a different place in life that's very different from me. It can be it can be kind of intense to be attentive to them, I think. Um, and a similar thing, I think, with just uh, the, that level of attention um, and and uh, and whatnot at the beginning of the of the exercises can also be pretty intense. Yeah, there's a, there's another side to that which I've struggled with to some extent. To some extent, I still do, but especially in the novitiate of compare and despair. Sure. Like you're looking at all of these other people. Uh, so, for example, I so I entered the the Jesuits after completing a junior college education. Uh, didn't have a four year degree, and I'm there with, you know, mechanical engineer, these guys with advanced degrees in philosophy and theology. One of the guys a year ahead of me is a Rhodes Scholar for crying out loud. Wow. And yeah. so here I am, junior college, like, what am I doing? I have made clearly made a mistake. Right. I'm from Tyler, Texas. That's right, Tyler. <laughs> and, like, eventually somebody's going to come, you know, knock on my door and say, actually, you know, we just, like, we actually found your application, yeah. and there's been a mistake. We thought you were like, someone else. You shouldn't yeah, be the, here. The paper, papers were shuffled incorrectly. Yeah. You have to leave. Yeah, now. and so, I like, I legitimately struggled with that for a long, long, long time. Oh. You know, just not feeling adequate, like... God has made a mistake, and I'm just kind of faking it, pretending. Like that show, The Good Place? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's my life. Right. <laughs> uh, and, th- I mean, and especially that came back up in the, when, I was, when I was on the exercises, and that's actually became a big part for me for the first week. You know, seeing these guys that were clearly better than me, clearly more holy than I, than I am, uh, that just that had it made. You know, they'd be in the chapel praying, that, you know, like they were touched by an angel or whatever. Right, yeah. And I'm just sitting there like, oh, my God, what am I doing? Like, is this, is this over yet? Yeah. No. And so the evil spirit was there saying, look. And so he was showing me all of my faults and saying, look how, look how unworthy you are. What do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are being here with those guys? Right. Look how great they are. Right. Um, and so that was a big part for me is to say, okay, well, Basically, I've got two choices, and this kind of, get, again, gets into one of our other meditations later on down the line. Like, I've got two standards that I've got, that I've got in front of me. I can go and give in to that evil spirit and say, well, yeah, okay, I've got, I've got nothing. I'm nobody. Right. Uh, I'm worth nothing. That's death. Yeah. <laughs> that leads to death. Yeah. Or I can choose the standard of Christ um, and become a soldier under that banner. 
uh, and choose life and say, okay, well, genuinely praying through my own sinfulness, through my own faults, through my own weaknesses, through these, these shortcomings that I've got, and recognizing that God is still calling. Right. Like, there's a beauty there that I think, well, I know that the evil spirit doesn't want us to, to hear, that the evil spirit doesn't want us to realize yeah. That all we have to do, and it's literally, I mean, I, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is the end of John's gospel when, after the resurrection, when the, when the disciples are out on the, on the boat all night long and they haven't caught a, a thing. And then Jesus appears on the shore and he's like, have you tried the right side of the boat? <laughs> <laughs> like you'd think these professional fishermen would have thought, you know, we've been out all night, we haven't caught anything. Maybe we should try a different spot. Like, so I always laugh when I read that, like, of course, all you have to do is literally turn around and there it is. But sometimes it takes Jesus telling you that because we get so focused. We, the evil spirit focus us, focuses, us so, focuses us so much on one particular thing that we lose out on the glory of the Lord. Uh, and I, and I, I really do believe that that's, um, that's why we do this. That's why... Because again, I think even as we're talking, like, why would anybody willingly go into something like this when they just sit there and think about their sins all day long? You know, it being so difficult, like we were saying, such work. Um, Well, I think you have to do that so that you can recognize yourself, ourselves as desperately, desperately, desperately in need of that love, in need of that mercy, in need of that forgiveness. And that it's there. Like, that's the thing. It's there. It's been given. That's right. the cross. Like that's why we do this, <laughs> right? And that it's not. Yeah, exactly. And um, and we're able to to think through our sins and recall them, and look at these memories, right? I think that the memory that we bring into the retreat um, is often a source of pain, um, but it's also exactly what what Jesus wants to encounter and heal. Uh, and so that is what when I'm thinking through my sins, that is the material that uh, I'm presenting to the Lord in prayer, and uh, often speaking to Him about. Uh, allowing the the story of the gospels and the encounters with the Lord that I that I meet him uh, in, uh, especially in the second week, but but even in the first week, um, that that encounter of healing uh, of of the, what I bring into the retreat of my own memory, of my own experience, my own attachment to sin, mm-hmm. um, that that's that's kind of the work of the first week is is uh, God meeting me in that dark discouraging place. And, uh, and not letting me be discouraged by it, you know, but, yeah. but encouraged that he's uh, working in it um, with me on my behalf. Um, so, yeah, you know, one of the psalms that I prayed with quite often in that first week, uh, and I, I bring this example up quite often, uh, and I can never remember. I always intend to go look up which psalm it was, <laughs> and I always forget. Oh. I always want to say like 51, 53, but I don't think that that's right. Uh, anyway, it's the psalm where it begins. It's a really kind of visceral psalm, like you're a worm, you're nothing. Oh, sure. Uh, but one of the lines is, Lord, your arrows have sunk deep into me. And that th- just that image uh, kind of stuck with, has stuck with me. Obviously, I'm, I still use it in spiritual direction to this day. Um, but it really hit me like, man, I've got all of these sins that are like arrows that are stuck into my chest. Um, and they're literally, I don't know if you remember the movie Donnie Darko. <laughs> it's a weird movie <laughs> sure. to bring up in this no, no, context. Um, but there is that, re- again, kind of bizarre scene where he had that like that uh, spear, like water torpedo thing shooting out from his chest. He was following it. Okay. Uh, anyway, that's as far as I'm going to take that example. But like these arrows are there literally pointing the way of wherever you're going to go. Your sins are there in a sense. They're not dictating the choices that you make, but they're, they're influencing. Sure. Like your experiences affect the way that you make choices in the world. Like we all know that. Well, our sins do <laughs> as well. Uh, and so you've got these sins kind of guiding you and leading you. And I remember after, it wasn't until after the retreat that the, uh, the assistant novice master asked me, who who do those arrows belong to or something like that? And I remember just being kind of hit by that. Like, mm. man, m- mine? No, like God's? Are these God's arrows? I mean, it says, Lord, your arrows have sunk deep into me. But like, these are my sins. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've worked hard for them. <laughs> right, no, right. Um, 
but there's there's something beautiful there i think that you know and that's the beauty of the sacrament of confession that i want to talk a little bit more about that once we confess these sins they don't go away you know that's not that's not the beauty of the sacrament right it's not snapping your fingers and that, it all just disappears yeah, we, it's not just erased from memory from history the effects of sin remain right you know there's still guilt there's still shame sometimes I think one of the, and I, again, I hope I'm not falling into heresy here <laughs> or just outside of church teaching, but I think one of the beautiful things about the sacrament is that once you confess your sins, you're in a sense giving them over to God sure. so that they do belong. They don't go away. Those errors are still there leading and guiding. Right. Uh, and the wounds may take a while to heal even after you confess, um, but they belong to God. <laughs> yeah. And they have to be transformed, right? Um, I mean, I think that I mean the I don't think there's uh, heresy at all because uh, I think of Jesus Christ carrying the sins of the people, right? Mm-hmm. That he's uh, a lamb led to slaughter, um, and it's because he carries the the blame um, that the people deserve that is rightly theirs. Uh, he takes it on himself. So I think I think that in that sense, um, yeah, confession is, and I think we even experience this to some extent as as priests hearing confessions that. Um, you know that I, I've actually thank praise God. I, I've frequently received the the grace to forget sins uh, after the confession is over, and I think I typically forget sins really quickly, actually. Um, but every now and then, you know, I'll carry it for a short time after, and I'll I'll sort of um, just be mindful of of uh, something that happens in confession and carry it with me. Uh, and I often find that to be uh, something consoling. That that's something of the experience of Christ. That it's not a matter of just. Um, uh, yeah, snapping your fingers or magic. It's not magic, right? It's not that yeah. these are just magically disappeared. It's that uh, Jesus Christ takes them on himself and carries yeah. them. And the, the priest, I think, sometimes has to carry those sins for a time um, and hopefully do penance for them, right? Mm-hmm. That, the, mm-hmm. that the priest who hears confessions often uh, ought to do penance for his penitence. Um, and uh, that's one of my, I think it's Jean Vianney. Uh, I think that's talked right, about yeah. uh, that I only give small penances, or maybe I only give small penances to those who come to me for confession because I take the hard ones on myself. Mm. Uh, and I think that's a mm. profoundly yeah. priestly, Christ-like attitude um, that, uh, that there's a, obviously a, a, a duty um, on the part of the penitent to do, to do some sort of penance, um, to kind of root out the, the vice and to plant a virtue um, in that moment after confession. But but the priest, I think, to a larger extent, um, kind of carries the burden of, of doing the penance and maybe even of, uh, of sort of like mourning the loss uh, that that sin encompasses and, um, and being able to, to carry that for the, the person who's now free of it. Um, and, and then hopefully the person who leaves the confessional experiences that freedom immediately and as a, yeah. as a lightening yeah. of their conscience, a lightening of, of the burden, um, that they are immediately free from that moment of absolution. Um, but that there still might be sort of a playing out of, of that forgiveness in their life and in their own way of viewing themselves and of their, their habits, um, right? That they have to build virtuous habits uh, quickly after mm-hmm. confession if they're going to avoid sin in the future. Um, and so there's lots of repercussions of, of that forgiveness, but, but hopefully immediately they, they have some sense that it's, that it's there, um, even if the sins t- take time to kind of work themselves out and to be healed. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Why do you think, and again, I'm going to be quite honest, I had never heard, I grew up Catholic not, and not a very Catholic part of the country, sure. yeah. but I grew up Catholic and I had never heard of this thing called a general confession. Mm-hmm. Why don't you think that's more widely known? Well, can you explain what that is first? Yeah. So a general confession is a uh, confession of all the sins of one's life, um, going back to as far as one can recall. Um, and I think the most helpful way of thinking about it is that it's more kind of thematic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that the number and kind matter. Um, in order to make the valid confession, right, you have to confess mortal sins by number and kind. Um, and so any mortal sins that you bring to the general confession ought to have that, right? But, but any sins that you've already confessed, uh, it's often more important to recognize kind of movements in your life of, um, you know, for example, I, I mentioned friendship earlier and, and like distrust of friends or uh, neglecting friends or, or not, not letting them love me. Right, that could be like a, a root sin of my of my life, um, and so I could recognize all the way that that's played itself out over mm-hmm. the many years mm-hmm. that I've been alive, and all the ways in which that's kind of um, made all sorts of destructive habits in me and and kind of shaped me, uh, and then in particular of the way that the Lord has now responded to that, um, and that now 
you know, in my relationship with Jesus Christ as a friend, right? That that's a very particular, like, reworking and healing of that wound of, uh, of my life. Um, and so I think just recognizing all of that, that's kind of the, the hope of a general confession is that uh, you can look at the very particular sins. And I think it's, it's really helpful if you're not afraid to confess the grave sins mm. um, uh, um, throughout one's life, but also to recognize that sometimes the, the other sins, like gossip or, or something that's not necessarily a mortal sin, um, that can be also a root sin. Uh, and so to, to really do a, an accurate appraisal of, of what is the kind of the, the overarching themes of my struggle with sin in my life and to confess that and to kind of place it all before the Lord. Um, I think that there's also an, often an experience of like, well, I don't know if I confess that or not. Um, maybe I never said it fully. Maybe I didn't ex- explain it well enough to the confessor to really for him to appreciate. You know, so like that scrupulosity, I think. Mm-hmm. The general confession can also be a huge cure for that. Um, that now I've, I've said everything with a mature adult understanding of, of, of all of the repercussions of what this sin was and that I haven't left out any, any um, you know, detail that I was afraid of before, even if I kind of alluded to it. Um, now it's just plain and clear and my conscience um, is open before the Lord. And so I can receive that forgiveness uh, fully and have a clear conscience and be free of it. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, it's a tremendous practice, actually, and, I, and it's a hugely important aspect of the, of the first week. Mm-hmm. So, so why, don't, why isn't it more known? Like, why don't, why don't more people do this? Well, I think Did it's, Ignatius invent it? Uh, that's a great question. I don't think so. I don't, I actually think this don't, is a I don't know that question. practice in the church. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, um, it's something that someone would only have if they have access to kind of intensive spiritual mm-hmm. direction mm-hmm. nowadays, I think. Yeah. Um, although you could just approach your pastor at a, at a parish and, and ask, uh, or someone, some other priest, and ask to... To make a general confession, um, um, and that that happens, but it's something often that people who are making a more intensive kind of spiritual exercise think to to do. Yeah, um, I think I think probably yeah the, the the reason it's not more common is just that uh, confession is not more common, right? Yeah. And that people, um, I think many of us uh, struggle to go to confession more than once a year, right? That the that the minimum uh, is sort of a good guide, mm-hmm. and that that's what. I think hopefully most of us uh, do, mm-hmm. but um, but the struggle to con- go to like monthly confession, right? That that's something that I I had to kind of struggle with for a while. Yeah. Um, so how do I confess? You know, uh, venial sins, and is this really is this a waste of the priest's time? Is this like is it, <laughs> am I making any progress? I'm confessing the same sins over and yeah. over again, right? Yeah. So I think those sorts of questions can kind of dissuade people from making a more regular confession. Um, and I think the general confession of, well, like, well, the priest, I don't want to take up an hour or like longer of his time. Like he's a priest, he's busy. I can't, can't I can't bother him with this. Um, I think maybe that's another reason that people, mm-hmm. uh, struggle with it, but, um, it's a great, it's a great practice. And or they've been taught that, well, I'm doing okay. Yeah. Like, Hey, I'm, I'm not, I'm not as need, bad as I don't need guy. confession. Like, I'm not Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm not, <laughs> you know, um, like, okay, good. That, that's good that you're not. Yeah. Um, but, um, Yeah. Uh, the only way yeah. that we avoid becoming really terrible, though, is it by addressing the smaller sins, too, right? So um, I think sin has a way of increasing unless we're yeah. actively fighting it. Yeah. And, that's, and that's the scary thing about, um, yeah, thinking that, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not great, but I'm not terrible, mm-hmm. um, is that, well, I'm, I'm probably getting worse if I'm saying that, right? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think this was the, my novice master that, that told me this, um, but it's been a practice that I've, that I've had all of my Jesuit life specifically for confession is that you know how how you get there and you have it in your mind what you want to say what you're going to confess and then you get there and think you know that's actually not that big of a deal i'm not going to say that when i catch myself <laughs> i say it immediately yeah shame the devil right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> i say it immediately and immediately recognize how ludicrous i was for fearing that right like how silly that was to think that i don't need to say that. I mean, like that's the evil spirit at work trying to tell you, don't worry about that. That one's fine. And it, yeah, and that you be, needed that, right? It can be such an illustrative <laughs> experience too to recognize, like, what what foolishness to think yeah. that, like, somehow hiding this well because it's not really a big deal. Therefore, I'm gonna I'm gonna hide it. Yeah, say it anyway, and then have a, have the clarity of, well, I, I didn't really need to say that, but I said it anyway just to um, be you know, be confident. Yeah, uh, right. And that confidence because you know sin muddles our vision and prevents us from seeing things correctly and, and appreciating the scope of our sins. Um, confessing everything is actually a, a pretty good practice, and yeah. I, I, I think you have to be attentive to, to not being scrupulous uh, and like scrupulosity. I think a, a priest will tell us if we're if we're falling mm-hmm. into that. That being said, 
I think any any time we're, we're tempted to like hold back um, um, anything that that's that's going to be a something to be attentive to. Yeah, because it often will be a moment of grace to like. Yeah, no, I need to say this anyway. Yeah, you know, I think. Um, yeah, I think there's been a lo- a big disservice as well when we when we have a conversation around sin, we try to be, and this happens so often when I teach. You know, certainly with RCIA or you know, when you go over the sacraments in like a high school classroom, people are so interested in finding out how far they can go without crossing the line. Mm. It's like, well, is this a sin? Right. Is this a mortal sin? The does it count game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I find that to be so unhelpful. And I, f- and I think counterproductive. Right. Because, and I'm getting this from uh, mostly from the great divorce from C.S. Lewis, who's not Catholic. Okay, uh, but like literally anything taken to its perverse extreme can cut you off from sonship or daughtership from the Lord. Right. You know, it's not. I mean, okay, murder is bad, and yeah. like that will cut you off, <laughs> cut your spirit off. Um, but so can lying, right. you know, or, those little white lies, gossip. they build up, they build up, they build up, they build up. It may take longer, but it's going to happen right. if you don't get a handle on it. And lying is a good example because I often, uh, I tell one lie and then I have to tell another lie to cover up the yeah, first exactly. lie. <laughs> and then I'm maintaining like two yeah. lines of, of, of false truth that uh, I have to keep up. And, yeah. and the lies just sort of build and build. And eventually I, I get scared. Oh, no, my, my lie is going to come out. And then, therefore, I have to do something more aggressive uh, yeah, uh, and more blatantly, maybe mortally uh, sinful. Um, and you can see how sin builds and grows. And yeah. uh, we just have to cut it off at the earlier stages to avoid those kind of nasty yeah. growths that come later. Oh, for sure. And, I th- you know, I think that is a defense for, you know, for a certain degree of scrupulosity. Like, we should be mindful of those. Now, we don't want to treat that initial little white lie as a right. fully blown mortal sin. <laughs> right. And this is a, this is a struggle. But we have to treat it as, if I don't do anything, then it will get there. Right. So I need to be afraid in that sense, but not in the same, in the same way right now. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think of the, the classic example of scrupulosity is uh, I walked by a church and I, I didn't make a, the sign of the cross. Father, yeah. All right. Or, uh, you know, that um, uh, someone, you know, told me uh, uh, something uh, and, I, and I immediately uh, thought of how I could, um, you know, tell it to someone else or something like that. Um, like, well, I thought about it, but I didn't, I didn't do it. Uh, I walked by the church. I didn't make the sign of the cross. Like, is that a sin? Is it good to make the sign of the cross when you cross by, walk by a church? Well, yeah, that is that is a good holy practice. It's a pious practice, right? Is it sinful to to not be mindful of the fact that the blessed yeah. sacraments in the church and that you're not making the sign of the cross? Like, I, I, it's it's hard for me to say <laughs> that that's a sin, right? And I think as a as a priest, yeah. like I very rarely, I I hardly ever uh, tell someone, oh no, that's not a sin, right? Sure. But 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 just that that practice of being so wrapped up in, um, am I doing things that may not be essential to holiness, um, and and uh, and that I'm kind of exaggerating the significance of this one thing that I'm doing, when all along, I mean, I might be, you know, laying on the horn and going 100 miles right, an hour, right? And I'm not attentive to that, but I but I worry about, um, you know, whether or not I, I made the sign of the cross when I yeah. passed by a tr- church, right? Splinter, meat plank, right? Exactly. <laughs> so I think it's not that it's that there's no. Uh, lack of grace or, or, or um, that there's no sin there. It's that it's so out of proportion yeah. to other yeah. things that yeah. are of far w- much greater weight yeah. and significance um, that loving my neighbor should be what, what preoccupies me of, of how, do I, right. how do I help this person or, or love this person or forgive this person. Um, and if I forget to make the sign of the cross... Or, or don't really find that to be an appealing uh, pious <laughs> practice at all. Um, don't like, feel guilty. That's okay. And yeah. I don't need to feel guilty about yeah. that yeah. necessarily. Yeah, for sure. Well, there's so much more. I mean, we could just have a podcast on sin. Yeah, we kind of did. I mean, that's, yeah. That's, well, I mean, it's... We, we did a like lot more, a, but... Yeah, anyway. Right. Uh, and I there are a couple of other things that I want to talk about next time. Um, but we're about out of time. Okay. We are out of time. Okay. Uh, so I think we should end it there. But... Uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, I would say that uh, that I think sometimes we come into 
um, you know, talking about the exercises, and we think, oh, first week, sin. Ooh, scary. Yeah. Right? yeah. But it's so much more intimacy. And I think that's something that was the, the big takeaway for me is that, um, that when, I, when I reflect on my sins, what I'm really doing uh, is I'm inviting this friend, uh, Jesus Christ, to draw close to me, to draw close to these, like, really ugly parts of my life. Yeah. And, and that I don't have to hide from, uh, from this, like, these prying eyes of the Lord. Um, I don't have to hide from them because uh, when, they, when they come in and when they look at this, my sin, they don't condemn me for it. They don't... Um, they don't, uh, yeah, make me feel small and insignificant and love and unlovable, right? Instead, they free me from it, uh, and that then all I'm left with are these these eyes that that have forgiven me and loved yeah. me and are now close yeah. to me, and that there's less separation between the two of us, right? So I think ultimately, first week is intimacy, and yeah. I think that's that's what we hopefully can keep sight of as we're going through it mm-hmm. and as we're talking about it mm-hmm. and as we're inviting people to make the exercises. Is like this is actually, and that's why I love Lent. Like Lent is my favorite time of the year. <laughs> Honestly, I love it's, Lent. <laughs> it's all it's all about intimacy, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, a yeah. season of intimacy. For sure, I think for that's sure. Maybe also true of the first week. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Well, my final thought: go to confession.